and for thank you. For those of you who didn't have a chance to read about Dr. Chow, Dr. Chow is one of those speakers who is so distinguished. I actually have to read an introduction because I cannot remember all of your accomplishments and everything that you are taking on. So forgive me for reading. Dr. Anthony Chow is a professor at San Jose State University and the director of the School of Information. He's here with us tonight to talk about Reading Nation Waterfall, a three-year, $1.4 million project focused on increasing access to literacy and libraries for Native American children across the country. With that, Dr. Chow, I will let you tell everyone a little bit more about those five tribal communities and everything that you're doing. Welcome to Oregon. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the invitation uh, and the opportunity to share uh, our exciting project. Um, I had slides prepared, but I think I'm just going to forgo the slides and just, just kind of have a conversation. Um, so let me start off with a, a, a recent development. So I got word from one of our tribes in Northern Cheyenne, which is in Lame Deer, Montana. Um, because of the pandemic, uh, the money really hasn't started flowing yet as far as uh, uh, the grant. And so uh, I got word that they had set up the Little Free Library uh, in front of their Head Start Center, uh, but they do not have the money to put books into oh. that Little Free Library. And, and so we, we said, well, you know, we are the, the, the grant funding should be ready soon. Uh, and the way the uh, IMLS uh, funding agency uh, funds these projects is it's on a reimbursement model. And they said, we don't have the money to buy the books at all even if it's for reimbursement. So I share that as kind of an uh, intro to our project to give you an understanding on how important I think it is that we all help if we can. Uh, because I think that, as you know, uh, reading is a superpower. Uh, I'm actually on the board of uh, Little Free Libraries as well as a global organization. I'm so excited about how technology and um, how, you know, like we're doing here where I can't be a beautiful uh, Oregon, uh, but we're able to communicate really has extended our, our reach and opportunity to help others. Uh, and so, so I'll start there. Uh, the second uh, point, uh, and by the way, on that one, uh, I'm going to make it uh, a school wide. So the School of Information has around 3000 students uh, all across the globe or, or by far the largest MLS program in the world. Uh, and it's a privilege to be the director because we have so many wonderful contacts. And so I'm going to make it my personal mission to fill that little free library of books. Uh, and, you know, there couldn't be a better time with Thanksgiving coming up. Uh, but I, I, you know, it, there's nothing that gets me more frustrated and excited about the opportunity to help help those kids. So um, second thing uh, is that the recent reading scores uh, for the National Assessment of uh, uh, Educational Progress has come out in 2022. Uh, and whereas uh, the Native American, uh, Alaska Native reading, average reading scores for fourth graders was around 200, 203, which was by far like 16 points below the national average. Uh, it has now gone but under 200 to 198. Now, Case in, uh, with that being said, certainly because of the pandemic, all fourth grading, all fourth grader uh, national reading scores have gone down. Uh, but uh, certainly this is, I think, the first time it's ever gone below 200. Right? And so what does that mean? It means that uh, the average fourth grade reading score for Native American and Alaskan Natives is below the basic reading equivalency level. Now, what does that mean? It means that the famous Hernandez study uh, in 2011 by the Casey Foundation, which really established that third grade literacy that we hear about. If you're not reading literate by third grade, uh, everything uh, in terms of indicators is exponentially negative, right? So everything from graduation uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, academic achievement, but worst of all, and this is, this is not just lore, uh, cities and counties use the third grade literacy score to determine how many jails they're going to need uh, beyond that third grade level. Right? So that's how close that correlation is. Obviously, it's correlation. There's a lot of other variables. But reading is a marker that we all can understand. 
and reading is a marker for third graders that in some ways dictate uh, their future, right? And again, it's not, it's not exclusive, but it's certainly uh, very, uh, there's a very strong statistical relationship. So anyway, re reading Nation Waterfall. So our, our goal was uh, to basically uh, create red boxes for books, right? So why did, why is red box? Anybody use a red box? No. Probably not any, not, not any longer, right? Because who uses a DVD, right? So, uh, right. but, but probably five years ago, 10 years ago, you probably use a red box, right? And why, why did they put up, uh, put Blockbuster out of business? Because of the convenience, right? So instead of going to Blockbuster, uh, we rented a movie while we were shopping, right? Uh, and it's a brilliant idea. So anyway, that's what we're trying to do with our Reading Nation Waterfall, is we are trying to do several things. One, build a network we're calling a reading ecosystem, uh, where the school libraries work with Head Start centers that work with public libraries. And those three legs of the stool basically contribute together to form a library uh, reading ecosystem that puts the little free libraries at Head Start centers, elementary schools, and where children are, right? Why is that? Because in my uh, long uh, term experience of libraries, we know that the people that tend to use libraries tend to be the core educated in the community. The rural and lower, lower socioeconomic and less educated tend to use the libraries less, right? That's always been a source of frustration for libraries because the very people we wanna serve the most uh, are the ones that we see the least. Right, and so this project, uh, as I was told by MLS, uh, was about 10% of their entire uh, budget for that year. And so they basically said, you better deliver, my man, because we, we have a lot of faith in trying to bring books to the children as opposed to the children coming to us. And so uh, kind of in a nutshell, uh, we, uh, all five tribes uh, are um, all in Title I, uh, uh, 90, 79, 80% of or above uh, free and reduced lunch. Uh, and what we uh, have discovered is that they're book deserts. Uh, so essentially uh, there's no money to buy books. Uh, and um, uh, even the libraries that are there uh, are not very well funded. Uh, and so essentially the access to books uh, is a kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? So no money to buy books, uh, no access to books. Uh, and therefore children are growing up in both deserts, right? And so, uh, so that's kind of in a nutshell, that's our project. And, and if, I do have slides if you want to know more, but I figure, especially because you guys are in such a festive area, I didn't want to break out the slides. Um, but I think that uh, ultimately uh, the intent and the hypothesis is pretty simple. If we put books in the hands of children, especially before they get to elementary school, they build a love of reading. And that love of reading is basically not thou shall read because it's good for you or thou shall read because uh, you will do better at school. It's because it's establishing the wonder and the beauty of reading uh, by accessing things that you're excited about. And children in particular, uh, they haven't been educated yet. Uh, so they're not thinking about grades. They're not thinking about achievement. They're not thinking about any of that. They're just, they're just their minds are sponges, right? Color, touch sound you know all of those things uh, are critical for cognitive development and so um and so again we feel pretty confident it's going to work uh, i've got a meeting with microsoft tomorrow uh to talk about actually helping support this effort uh as well and, and again uh, it's a small thing that we can do uh but i, I don't know about you I, I get goosebumps to be able to help children that i'll never meet uh build a love of reading um you know because uh, they have access to resources they wouldn't other have so, so I'll stop there. Um, uh, and again, I, I've got I've got slide decks. I don't want to threaten you with those, but <laughs> but uh, you know I'd be happy to answer any questions. I think it'll be a good conversation. So. All right, let's start uh, with uh, Zoom. Molly, you have a question? Go ahead and unmute and uh, go ahead. Are these children English speakers before they get to school? Yes. Uh, uh, the so two of the five tribes. So uh, Adrian Adri had asked about where the tribes are. I apologize. They are uh, two two in Montana, uh, two in North Carolina, and one in New Mexico. So there's no, uh, no none in Oregon. The uh, 
the Northern Cheyenne in Montana and the Eastern Bend in North Carolina only have 300 uh, uh, native speakers left. And all of their children, or not all, but the majority of their children actually are, are trying to learn their language in school as a second language. Well, so, right. Yeah. The, uh, the second question is, do you know about the Dolly Parton Library? Yes. Program? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I've, I reached out to them about being a partner. I haven't, uh, I haven't had any success uh, there. That, I think that's a, a wonderful, amazing program. Uh, but I guess the way I would look at it is, uh, or let me ask you guys, uh, would one book a month be enough for you? In other words, it's great. It is wonderful. But I guess um, our envisioning is not just one book, not just two books, three books, four books, five books a week, right? Appearing uh, right there in front of your Head Start Center. So yeah, no, Dolly Parton is amazing. The amount of money that's being spent, uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm of the belief that it's not enough. That that one that one book a month is not enough. I do like that it starts at infancy. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think also it provides access, right? So that's one of the things about the field that I love the most is it's are always focusing on equal access, equal access. That, that yeah. all children deserve an equal shot. Because yeah, they're they're mailed to the kids. Okay, other people can ask questions. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, yeah. and do you have contacts, Holly, with Dolly, Dolly Parton? Uh, just, I mean, Rotary tends to fund a lot of Dolly Parton projects. Yeah. And Eugene Library has does do Dolly Parton in our area, and it's. Uh, I like the fact that it starts at at infancy. Yeah, that'd be great. So I would love to continue. If anyone has contacts, I'd love to talk to the Dolly Parton Foundation, and I would love to to, to partner up. It's definitely not in competition. There, there are many, of course, wonderful things uh, that that are. Uh, and again, that's part of what we're trying to do is bring people together, though, to work on this together. So. Okay. And we had another question online from Andrea, who uh, asks. Uh, when you said the five tribes, is that the five tribes in Oregon or something else? Yeah, uh, we we're we're just starting with uh, the Northern Cheyenne and the Crow in uh, Montana, uh, the uh, Eastern Band and the Lumbee in North Carolina, and uh, the Santo Domingo uh, Pueblo uh, in New Mexico. Um, and there wasn't any real reason why they were selected, uh, other than contacts and kind of a convenience of sample. Uh, as well as meeting that social economic um, uh, status as far as uh, being in need. So, and again, Andrea, I would love to work with tribes in Oregon. Uh, we, we're not ready to, to kind of generalize yet because we're just getting started because of that dad burn pandemic. Uh, but, but we are, we are getting, we're starting to, starting to, to ramp up. So. Good, thank you. And in the room, we've got a question from Warren. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, I was helping at a dining room for homeless people the other day, and some of the people who were there as volunteers, we were just talking about the books we were quote unquote reading. And I was talking about audible books and how I've become a convert over to audible books. And I was told by one of the volunteers, well, that's not really reading. And I, I just wonder, what do you think about that? Is like listening as valuable as quote unquote reading? Are they the same? How are they different in terms of cognitive skill development? Yeah, that's a good question. I think, I think of course, it depends on where you are in life. Um, so I would say that uh, obviously for children and kind of brain development, uh, it all occurs, uh, uh, most, most of our brain development occurs uh, by five or six and certainly by 10, uh, you know, most of our brain development is already there. So uh, the reason why I say that is because when you think about a book, uh, it, it is, uh, uh, audio is one of the senses, but uh, when you think about books, we're thinking uh, print, the touch and feel of paper, uh, you know, obviously the children's books have more, have other things as well, right, uh, touch. Uh, and then the other thing uh, is uh, 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 the Pediatric Society has come up with is that it's, it's really good for emotional and physical development with caregivers. 
as well. So, so not answering your question yet, audio is important, certainly by all means, but I think it's one of the senses, right? So I think for children, uh, we want to prime all five, right? Smell, I don't think is, is much, uh, but I think uh, virtual reality and those kind of things, it's starting to add that as well. Uh, so uh, audio, yes, audio is still great. However, uh, obviously uh, uh, it, the preference would be uh, more of the senses being used as well, but certainly audio singing. Uh, and of course, uh, your question goes to also the beauty of stories in general, which is, you know, the wonder of stories, the, the sharing of ideas, uh, the, the metaphors, analogies, allegories, relationships, uh, you know, imaginations, your world, so it all can be done by audio, for sure. Yeah. So, I mean, yes, uh, audio is real uh, and definitely for us driving uh, in California traffic or Oregon traffic, uh, audio is a must uh, uh, because you can't, can't uh, uh, physically read at the same time. But I would also throw out that uh, um, uh, the iSchool is big in virtual reality and mixed reality. Uh, I think that is also here. Uh, so one of the partners that we have is called XR Libraries. Uh, and so uh, the print, there are two things we're doing, print books. One, XR Libraries now has QR codes on the print. I know uh, the traditionalists probably are going to roll your eyes, but they actually have QR codes on, uh, as, uh, underneath the illustrations where if you use the app, uh, basically uh, the characters pop up on the on the book, right? In other words, you just you use your phone and the uh, characters actually pop up on the book, right? And so, uh, you know, what does that look like? Well, imagine reading about uh, ML King's I Had a Dream speech and having uh, ML King pop up in front of you and give you the, the I, I Had a Dream speech, right? So, so that's mixed reality. And I'm really excited. The other is that we, it's using the whole lens too. We're experimenting with story time uh, where they, uh, mixed reality basically means clear goggles. Uh, um, and basically uh, the story, uh, the, the story reader uh, can be using those goggles, uh, show uh, the illustrations to the kids while they're reading. So, you know, when you read, you didn't have to turn the book over to show, show them the illustrations. Imagine being able to read and show them the illustrations while actually having to turn it over uh, to show the kids. So anyway, there's a lot of cool stuff happening. And it's all, I think, uh, kid, kids in society will benefit, obviously, in, in moderation. So. My wife and I recently moved up from the Bay Area. And Catherine has been a volunteer at the Cynic Quest. Film and virtual reality festival for 15 years. And I would recommend that maybe you connect with Alton Hussey and Kathleen Powell at CineQuest because the virtual reality component to CineQuest is becoming more important as each festival is produced at, at CineQuest in downtown San Jose by the California Theater. And they love. Um, profiling projects like you know virtual reality, especially for children. That would just, and, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna send a quest. Yes, thank you so much. That I uh, definitely will 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 follow up. Um, this is actually my only my uh, beginning of my second year here in California. So so that's I appreciate that. All right. Do we have any other questions in the room? Uh, we have a question from Chris. Uh, Anthony, uh, you're in the School of Information, and you've alluded to some of the potential partnerships that you're involved with. Can you just talk a little bit more about your vision for the role of technology in this project, and then specifically about the role of um, tracking outcomes? So you, you, you began with the reference to the uh, correlation between reading and incarceration. And I'm actually in the prevention business, and so I'm greatly interested in how we track the impacts of investments in prevention programs. Yeah, that's that's a, I appreciate that. So I think that um, so first of all, I would guess I would say I would start with kind of the systems approach uh, of of building any kind of successful system, which is inputs, outputs, and outcomes, right? And so uh, I'm a professional evaluator. Uh, so if you if I'm if I'm asked uh, to evaluate any system, I'll always use the logic model, uh, which basically tracks your inputs, outputs, and outcomes. And that basically means inputs are resources. So 
uh, when I come or when we develop any system, the question first is, are you putting resources into your high priority items? Because if you're not, uh, the likelihood, uh, of course, of, of it actually re leading to an outcome is pretty much nil, right? So inputs, what resources are you investing? Uh, and so when we're talking about children and cognitive development. One of those huge inputs, I think we'd all agree with their books, right? And, and let's be candid, print books that they can touch, they can hold, they can, you know, they can crinkle, whatever, right? Uh, so um, from a, and my background actually is cognitive psychology, the cognitive mind just goes crazy. Uh, when you're holding a book and reading a book and you're cuddling with your caregiver, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that I would start, I would start there. I think that uh, really um, the, the desire to uh, uh, impact inputs and outputs uh, is really, you know, again, the foundation of this project. So how do we assess that? And I'll get to your question about technology uh, is basically, first of all, inputs, right? How many books are going into the little free libraries how many books are going out of the little free libraries? Well, the good news is that every book that goes into the little free, little free library is gone. Now, now we don't know, uh, you know, uh, 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 hopefully like in the Crow, for example, they do not, they, they did not want us to put the little free library outside of the buildings because uh, vandalism is a, a known issue. So they're actually in the buildings. Uh, but anyway, the assumption is that the majority of the books that go in the little, the little free libraries and leave are going to children, right? So that's the first measure. Are, how many books are going in and are they all going out? Well, we can tell you that they're all going out. And some have, not, have actually had no books go, go in yet. Uh, but uh, the, the two measures, uh, primarily outputs that we're looking at are the uh, kindergarten reading scores. So when you, when you come in kindergarten, right after the first month or so, you have an early, you have your first reading test, right? That is, where are you, right? And so uh, the... The average percentage that we have of our five elementary schools, kindergartens, uh, is around 75% are not uh, uh, read at kindergarten reading equivalency, right? In other words, they are behind already. Uh, and so our first measure is that we hope to statistically significantly increase uh, that, read at, that equivalency reading percentage, right? Um, so we, we hope to see uh, that, uh, that increase. The other is uh, the fourth grade reading score. So the NAP reading score, and I just talked to my team actually just before this meeting, uh, where uh, because it's dropped down to 198, uh, to be honest, that uh, by the time they take it in two years, uh, I'm pretty confident there'll be a statistically significant increase with the understanding that I'm riding the coattails of post pandemic, right? So we know it's gonna go up significantly no matter what Reading Nation Waterfall does. However, it goes back to the inputs, outputs, and outcomes. So we're going to measure the fourth grade reading scores uh, for those elementary schools that are participating. And we're also going to measure uh, the outputs, uh, inputs and outputs that we have invested into those elementary schools, right? How many books have gone in? How much money has gone in? Um, how much has circulation gone up? And then we're going to measure that, that, uh, that, that reading score. So, And then your question about technology. Um, so uh, we had a board uh, of director meeting uh, in in uh, uh, in uh, Minneapolis uh, uh, about little free libraries, and so we all agreed, or I challenged the board. Uh, basically, the question I posed to my my peers was, "What do we think the fate of little free libraries are going to be if we just stick with print in ten years?" Right, um, and so let me let me give you, and you guys probably already know this, uh, uh, print books in libraries uh, and circulation of those books are going way down, right? Not a big surprise, uh, but also when you, when you match that with sustainability and the commitment of libraries in the field to be as sustainable and environmentally friendly as possible, the, uh, the number of print books are going to go down. The circulation of print books are going to go down. They're gonna be replaced by the same books, the same authors, but there's gonna be uh, digital instead. So I think the answer to your question is that, uh, and we already have QR codes. So we already have uh, every book that we give out, we, we give them a little bookmark with a QR code, and that QR code goes to the website. Uh, what we're talking about, maybe it's a partnership with the Rotary, is Little Fee Libraries maybe being the world leader in digital access. Imagine these Little Fee Library boxes going up, going up in lawns that all of us have control over. 
right? That we can, we can build ourselves. And imagine that if, what, if you became a partner for Little Free Library, you got a little QR code that basically uh, allowed you to now access the largest digital repository in the world, right? Why is that? Because if I'm, if I'm a county or a municipal library, I'm stuck. I can only serve the people in my community, right? The Little Free Library is global. Right. And so I think that, again, reading will always be important. Audio, video, mix, whatever. People still have to write the books. People still need, to get, still need to get paid to write the books. They still need to be professionally edited. They still need professional illustrators. Well, now we're going to have VR people that are going to be part of that production process, too. So books are still going to be there. How we digest them, however, uh, we're going to have a lot of different uh, opportunities. So I'm excited about it. I'm excited for our kids. All right. Do we have any other questions in the room? Can I? Oh, Heather? If no one else has a last question. Thank you, Dr. Chow. I read something on your website about how librarians are the ones in charge of choosing the culturally relevant books for each of the communities. Can you tell us a little bit about that process? Absolutely. So, so first and foremost, we definitely wanted the librarians to be in charge of the curation because that's what they're trained to do. Um, however, um, I want to be clear that uh, several things. One, of course, a number of the librarians are um, me uh, registered members of the tribe, right? So that's that's one that's good. But the other is that we have an advisory committee, uh, you know, at each of the projects that basically drive uh, the uh, the whole project. Uh, the other is that um, the the way we have uh, identified the collection is so we actually have a national advisory board made up of uh, you know national reading experts, literacy experts, and a number of leaders in the Native American community that gave us the full universe of books that they would recommend, and then we brought it down to the tribes and said, okay, here's the full list. Take what you want out or add what you want back in, uh, and that uh, I'm going to put a link here. Those are the Amazon wish lists that you see on the website, right? Now we went with Amazon because obviously Amazon's Amazon. So two things about Amazon: one, they're much more expensive than 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 you know if a library bought them. So that's number one. But the beautiful thing is that if you buy a book on the Amazon wish list, within a day or two, that book is going to appear at the school library, and that book is going to be put in the little free library, right? No costs. Right, so that's the other thing. We we have no costs, right? And we're all, all of admin. I'm getting paid nothing, right? I love it. Uh, so we have no administrative costs. It's all about the books. It's all about getting the books in the hands of the children. So yes, back to your question. Uh, there there definitely is a lot uh, of, of culling and customization, and certainly the it's mandated, and we all believe it that of course the tribes themselves have to drive this project. So. Uh, I do have one more, Karen. Just one. Doctor, do you get the pushback on book titles and content like some libraries are getting um, around the country? No, no, not not uh, not so far. Um, I, I don't I don't think. Uh, however, I don't think any of the banned books uh, necessarily are in the collection either. <laughs> Uh, uh, so I think that uh, in terms of the, the selection process, um, you know, it's largely a combination of award winners, which of course could be in the band books as well, uh, and, and of course uh, Native American titles or other titles uh, that the, uh, the tri tribe would like, uh, like to see. So no, we have not had any pushback uh, as far as band books um, ago. So good, good, good question. Yeah, and that, that of course is uh, an ongoing um, ongoing I don't I don't know what the right word is ongoing situation uh, that uh, of course we're all paying very close attention to and as you're aware uh, Florida for example uh, one of the ways they're getting around book uh, this pesky librarians is getting rid of the position altogether oh, yeah. yeah so um, and then putting the parents in there yeah. from um, Scott <laughs> yes um, mine is more of a comment than a question uh, I just retired from the University of Oregon, where I used to teach DACA students about um, statistical methods and other things. So it's looking at multiple regression, and I would buy them from um, school scores from every student in Florida and then have the reading. And um, we'll see, we all know that schools are short funded, 
uh, what, what difference does that make? And we do the analysis and said, what we find, oh, lo and behold, the more money that's spent, to the worse they do. And um, finally, a student will say, well, maybe the, the money is going to where the schools need it most. Oh, okay, well, let's look at um, um, how well trained are these are these teachers? Do they have master's degree or such? Maybe that's what will make the real difference. It doesn't. Well, how about years in the field? No difference. Um, how about um, um, the size of the classroom? We all know that classes are way, way, way too big. What if um, we? What's the correlation between performance, student performance, and size of the classroom? Doesn't Not show up. Yeah. Then we get to social economic um, status. Oh man, does it show? It shows. It shows that everything depends on how well a student um, comes into the classroom and is prepared to be a student. And um, so I, I, I definitely appreciate your efforts and what you're doing um, to find an entryway for, for these students. Well, I appreciate that. And I, and I think uh, uh, building on your point, books are expensive. Uh, and, and we all know that, right? Books are expensive. In fact, uh, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I, I've donated hundreds of dollars, maybe thousands of dollars to my public libraries because my three children would always lose or, or, or have the, their book, the book checked out mixed into their libraries and we can never find them, right? And so I don't know how many arguments I've had with my lovely bride uh, about, uh, and of course, uh, the initial argument is well, we're going to cut them off from the library. And of course, I'm an LS professor. Again, no, we're not cutting them off to the library. We're going to donate money to them. But I'm, anyway, the point being is that books are expensive. And in fact, you know why people, you know why libraries have removed, are starting to remove the library fine, especially for children? Does anybody know? Can, get, can you guess why? Because on average, we'd find that at least 40% or higher of the children could not use their library because they have overdue fines that were not paid. Ridiculous, right? The very thing that we want, we're keeping the uh, in particular the poor from, from using our free resources because they can't pay for the library fine that we have, we've, uh, I mean, ridiculous, right? And so people are starting to realize it's ridiculous. And so anyway, going back to your point, obviously books are expensive and we can help continue to increase uh, the, those books and put them in the hands of children in poverty, then at least we're helping uh, in that one area. We can't control a lot of other things, but that is one thing tangible that I think that we can do. So. Okay, thank you. Uh, one more for Chris. Uh, sorry, one more for me. Um, I was just on your website after you explained the Amazon connection and, and I tried to order a book and it seems to have a technical glitch. So, um, okay, are you muted? Yeah, no, my dogs. Uh, <laughs> that's okay. the other, other. Oh, really? So you uh, you got an error? Yeah, the error says you can't, um, like it's not, let's see, this item can't be shipped to a wish list or a gift registry address. Ah, uh, okay. All right, I will definitely check. Uh, I, I appreciate you bringing that up. Um, and, and the other thing is you, you'll ask comments, maybe think about a project that I'm learning about right now called the Gravity Project, um, which I think a lot of people in this room might be interested in. It's a, it's a national group that is, uh, driving standards on the exchange of data related to social determinants of health. Hmm. It's called the Gravity Project. And so the idea is that anybody and everybody who has an interest in that area of social determinants of health would be able to exchange data and that can drive better and more consistent and rigorous research about what has impacts. I mean, I think it's, I think it's great. I mean, I can almost, I can almost kind of envision, you know, how like we choose a restaurant. Uh, I, I can envision um, looking at the healthiest amongst us and having kind of an analytic profile of, of what they eat and what they consume and what they do, you know, and us modeling after that behavior. Um, so yeah, I, I think that, I think that's, that's great. Okay, do we have any more questions from uh, the Zoom side? Please make your voice heard. 
And if not, uh, Dr. Chow, then I will thank you uh, for your time. It's uh, a very interesting discussion. Thank you very much. Um, and before I go, let me drop the link to the slide deck um, just so you have that. Uh, it's the same one that I did uh, with, the, with the main rotary, uh, but let me just drop that in there before I go. Get your password. How long did it take? That was very interesting. I didn't mean to put the end of it. I don't mean to overstate my welcome to that. Those are the slide decks there. Thank you so much for letting me know about the Amazon wish list. I'll get those fixed. Uh, especially because I'll, I'll be uh, meeting with Microsoft. And by the way, real quickly, Microsoft, what they do is uh, they're going to ask me to do a presentation similar to this. Uh, they donate $25 for every hour that they're, that for every member of their staff that joined that meeting. Uh, and then they also will follow it up with another $25 to match uh, their employees' time. And so, and then they, and they also do that book. So I got to get those Amazon wish list working uh, because yeah, basically uh, they buy a book and Microsoft will, will match it with another book. So I was ready. <laughs> uh, I promise I'll have it fixed by tomorrow. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. All right. uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take care. Have a good evening. So, sorry, just to, I wanted to comment on that last point. Um, I don't know about you all, but our family has started to try to encourage each other because we're going into the Christmas season, right? It's November. It's like, okay, people start to think about Christmas gifts. Um, I think this is a great idea for Christmas gifts. You know, tell everybody you know, this is what I want for Christmas, right? Give gifts to these guys. Cool idea, man. So, um, when we did yeah, the that uh, introduction the earlier, um, yeah. multiple there, I introduced you and we stepped out. So, wow, please, yeah. Metro, welcome there. And we'll go on uh, to the rest of the announcements. Uh, Paul, you may have seen an email from Paul. We do have a uh, grant request, and we will have our grants meeting next Tuesday at five o'clock here uh, in the Davis and on Zoom. So uh, please have a look at that. Uh, then we'll have the meeting, and then that will be followed by a board meeting. And so I, I, I would expect we'll probably end up with four or five or six at the board meeting, and everybody else is going to skedaddle and what else is going on in the world. Um, but everyone is invited to the board meeting, and uh, if you can make it, we could appreciate the, the help and the guidance on that. Uh, screen team, as a reminder, we've got scheduled for December 3rd. That'll be from 9 to 11, and uh, short of freezing rain or something crazy like that, I, I imagine we will be out there. So mark your calendars, and uh, I know uh, Laura sent out a, a request for attendance. Uh, so if you haven't seen that, just go ahead and email her uh, if you can make it. And with that, my announcements are done. Sort of happy dollars. Do we have any other announcements? Yes. I don't think I need the mic. I'm going to pass around a sign up sheet um, for uh, readers. We are going to reintroduce uh, the system of readers. Uh, that's the person who's going to be here welcoming both. Uh, members and guests um, handing out badges, taking down the names of guests so that the uh, president knows I'm going to be welcome here. Uh, so I'm going to ask you to put your name uh, on the one of those dates, and then I will send out a reminder when the time comes. Andrew, thank you. That's wonderful. Now that we have People in the room again, I, I think it's time that we do this. And so, and yeah. anyone who signs up to do that, uh, thank you for your assistance. Uh, we'll go James and Heather. Um, about one and a half weeks ago, uh, Princess Anne from the UK had arrangements with her husband to go on the tour of Uganda. And uh, they had a project, they were going to tour of the blind children who were staying in a boarding school in Nabokay. 
And the reason is most of the disabled kids in Africa don't get enough services through their homes. So they end up being boarding areas whereby they can get sponsorship. So these kids, about to hit what they, they are staying in this public school. As they went through the preparations of receiving Princess Anne, a lot was going on. Unfortunately, fire cold at night when you are sleeping. 